Hey everybody, it's Talk Gnosis, and we got a good one for you tonight. We are talking about theology and Wes Craven. Uh, now this is going to be part of our Halloween programming for 2023, but I don't want to say that Wes Craven was more than a horror director, because I think horror is a, is a fascinating genre, but his oeuvre is more expansive than you might think. And we've got uh, Jason as the co-host. Hello, Jason. Uh, where? Hey, we got the actual guest, Dr. David Gooden, uh, a returned uh, guest to the show. Great to see you again. Buddy. Great to be here. Great to be invited back. That I didn't wear out wear out my welcome the first time around. So. I'll <laughs> well, try harder this time. Yeah, e exactly. Well, you know, last time it was it was a very you know. Uh, some words were said. Some words were said, but water <laughs> under the bridge. So you edited a volume called Theology and Wes Craven, and uh, it, it's just a, it's a fascinating book. Uh, you know, I'll be honest, I, I didn't read the whole thing cover to cover yet, right? I, I read, uh, but yes. I did read a, a number of the essays. Uh, I've looked at the pictures. Yeah, I looked, I looked at the pictures, yeah. Um, I'm, uh, I'm waiting for the movie adaptation to come out, right? And then, then we can talk about that. But, you know, it's a fascinating volume. It's a fascinating idea. So can you tell us about theology and Wes Craven like the book itself like what is it how did it come to be what was the journey of editing it like oh wow uh, so many questions but yeah let's dive into it uh, I think many academics find their way here eventually uh, my main areas of study are patristics and philosophy but if you have experience of teaching you know that students don't get their information from books they come to you after class and say uh, Professor Gooden what do you think about this thing I found on the internet or back in the day, the Da Vinci Code or yeah. <laughs> Secret or things like that? And you can see in their eyes, in the realm of authority, this is some sort of competing narrative that I heard this to be true. And you were telling me this. How do I reconcile these two things? So the entire field of popular culture is underappreciated, needs to be on the spotlight because the shaper of people's self-understanding, uh, cultural understanding, religious understanding is more often informed by Dante's Inferno and Milton's Paradise Lost than it is any biblical catechesis they've undergone. So popular culture shapes what most people understand about themselves, the world they live in, and the cultural information around them. And this is as true of ancient Greece with the playwrights, Aristophanes, writing about the gods. This is where they learn this. And in fact, the playwrights were inventing stuff along the way too. So that brought me to the popular culture and theology field. And okay, Wes Craven, I was looking for a project. Like I've done some co-edited volumes before. They're really nice. They're available. Go check them out. I get no money from <laughs> but I wanted to do a solo project. And so I started looking at directors that have a large volume of work over many decades that define a particular era, particularly in Americana. And I was looking at Toby Hooper at first, and then Russ Meyer. Oh, really? I still want to do Russ Meyer. That, yeah. would, be, <laughs> that would be awesome uh, for a number of reasons. And somehow I stumbled upon Wes Craven, I just think on a whim, I started Googling around. I mean, everyone's got some familiarity with what's great. And usually it's like, oh, he did that too. Scream. Okay. Didn't he do music of the heart? Yeah, he did that too. <laughs> what about last up? Yeah. And one of the first things I found out about him is he was raised an evangelical Christian. And I said, I found my project. <laughs> How does an evangelical Christian come an era-defining horror director that has scared and and excited and entertained people from the 60s to some of his last work uh, was in 2010, uh, uh, was his last film, but he still had other works after that to 2015 when he passed away rather recently. So many decades a commentary on particularly American history, but also religious ideas. And and the more I dug, the more fascinating things I found. So I found my project. And I think uh, I've monologued for a little bit. 
<laughs> so I want you to jump in to redirect me uh, in a particular way if you want to. You know, I, I'm always sticking to our question sheet. I, I feel like, Jason, you're you're the spontaneous questions are arriving, uh, being beamed down from the pleroma and the, the ether. Did you have any anything you want to, to clarify, to ask, to any, any threads you want to draw on uh, right away? Yeah, well, you know, maybe. Like, I think there's... Um... Uh, there's already kind of like knowing that you're looking for a project that's in this, this, um, the interstices of like pop culture and spirituality and like, uh, uh, the, you know, the sort of that trajectory of like, of, um, uh, religion, mythology, like to just that, that, that cultural context that we usually put over here and say that it's, this is the spiritual progress of, of people. And then over here, we've got uh, you know, the, the economic machine of like film, books, comics, that kind of thing. Um, is there anything in print? Like, so I, I, I think Wes Craven's a perfect uh, subject for this, but is there anything about those connections in general or about those two things in general that you feel there's something interesting about bringing them together? Uh, <clears throat> well, indeed, um, uh, organizing my thoughts here briefly, uh, just imagine a computer with a circle, circle bit. <laughs> Buffering. I mean, what? Yeah, buffering. One of the realities of, I mean, going through this little project, directors don't have absolute creative freedom. The studio often gets involved, sometimes with disastrous consequences. Um, and also the pressures of making something marketable and turning it into a franchise and things like that. But even with those things in mind, he's definitely a director with a vision. Uh, I know we're going to talk about Vampire of Brooklyn later, but that was like one of the projects he he was losing creative control over because of Eddie Murphy. Wants to do an Eddie Murphy film, and you just aim the camera. But he found a way to make it a Wes Craven film along the process as well. So I guess the movie business is about business at the end of the day, not necessarily making art. Mm -hmm. And... At the beginning of his career, it was really kind of rocky. Uh, he had to like scrape together the money to do Nightmare on Elm Street, and it was really just unexpectedly successful. And mm -hmm. so that really saved him uh, and allowed him enough clout to start determining some of his own terms. But he kind of lost, he did lose control over much of the Freddy franchise and the numerous sequels, only having complete control over New Nightmare. Uh, a little bit later, though, it'll be interesting to hear. Sometimes it's not a fan favorite. It's certainly a favorite with me. Yeah, I, th I think it's an incredible film. Uh, it, it's definitely my favorite. I, I'd say it's one of my favorite horror movies. Have you seen it, Jason? Watch it. Watch it this Halloween. It's it's really it, it's really remarkable. It's uh um, but I it it wasn't what people expected or wanted, right? And this was after what like six uh, Freddy films where he gets more cartoonish each time. So yes, yeah. Uh, the evolution of, I mean, the character of Freddy Krueger, he's become, he became a delightful man-child with a thrilling sense of, of killing creativity that fans learn to crave. I mean, he, there's mm. even a rap song out there by the Fat Boys, you know, <laughs> get ready for Freddy. We are we are going to link that in the show notes. Please, <laughs> I, I'm going to please, please don't really go and watch that. It is awesome. And in the midst of this, Wes Craven returns with a just a frightening, even perhaps more frightening Freddy, who's not out to entertain you or thrill you or hit you with one-liners, uh, but kind of restoring his original vision uh, with some additional commentary. And fans know, you know, we 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 want the cute Freddy. <laughs> Yeah, well, so uh, fandom is a whole other, uh, you know, who who owns the work of art, uh, the producer or the reader? I think Foucault has a piece like on that. It's like, who is an author anyway? I think fandom can, can take ownership of a franchise more so than a director at times. You know, and like what what's interesting there too, like that actually, it calls to mind uh, a quote I think Alan Moore made that... Um, uh, that audiences don't know what they what they want. If they knew that, then they'd be storytellers. But they're not. They're the audience. And uh, when I've when I've related that quote to people, some of them respond very very sharply, like they find it almost insulting. You know, it's um, kind of like, insult. It's kind of meant to, yeah, yeah. And like it's 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 a 
uh, provoking statement, but then when you look at that same trajectory, it's like Freddy uh, was created by Wes Craven as a storyteller with this with this intent in mind, and I, like we can we can dig into that intent, but then uh, it becomes a franchise that is just delivering the bare minimum of of what of of the of the potential Wes Craven presents, you know, yeah. um, like it turns into slapstick, it turns into this like repetitive trope of a of a like a somewhat silly supernatural man child you know yeah um the full uh, franchise phenomenon like scream is unrecognizable to the original that um, was raven created it's just the formula we're going to go in it's going to be a guess who it's going to be filled with some meta stuff and some trivia it's going to be the same beats over again but nothing really new other than subvert your expectations it's really the cousin of the person from the first movie, their roommate is now out to kill. It's just, it's getting yeah. silly. But yeah, audiences want more of the same because I think part of the issue here, and in, this is like in defense, the purpose of horror or a purpose of horror, let me change the article there, I'm editing live, mm -hmm. <laughs> is to make is to make friends with your fear. And so if you know the beats, if you know the jump scare is coming, that it's easier to be comfortable with the experience that this is going to happen and then this is going to happen and then there's going to be the comeback at the end. They want the exact same beats with a little bit of variation. And that happens with pretty much every film out there from Star Wars to Scream to the Freddy franchise that there's truly nothing new, but some people are more comfortable with that because probably the first time they saw Freddy, they were scared to death and they've forgotten that part now they just dress up as freddy for cosplay for halloween so yeah making friends yeah. with their fear they they don't want to actually be frightened <laughs> well and i i wonder too though like um uh so like I, I think and moore's point is intentionally provocative but i wonder too like if you might even amend that point of saying like is it that the people want the same thing or that uh that the business tries to to repeat something without necessarily knowing it's um the 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 novelty that's truly driving it because i think like yeah. i think we are hungry for novelty like we are hungry for new interesting things you, you look at uh um how marvel and star wars are starting to feel like retreads and in a movie like uh, everything everywhere all at once comes out and people are like oh wow i can experience something new again <laughs> and it becomes incredibly popular like um Anyway, I'm, I, I think I'm kind of drifting from the point there, but I think like, I think like horror at its best maybe does live in that sense of novelty. You don't know where the jump scare is going to come out and that's why we want to go watch it. But then, yeah, like the, uh, at what, like when it starts to become a retread, um, it's like we're, we're, uh, um, it's like we're, we're focusing on the, the trope rather than the fear i don't know if maybe that makes sense as a as an approach oh, definitely, definitely. i imagine producers backstage it's they know the formula they know what works they know what people are paying to see given what they see i heard like mm -hmm. like the minions movie if they're gonna do a sequel we're gonna need more <laughs> minions more <laughs> minions per minute we've got to calculate minions per minute to keep audience <laughs> to drive audience interest but yeah what they do crave is the new uh the new terrifier 2 film is quite different from the first Terrifier film, but in the most awesome ways possible. And so that, however, might become a trope in the future with Terrifier 3. Are they going to repeat the same beats and, you know, just play around with the mythology a little bit more? But mm. Terrifier 2 is definitely a triumph of delightfully subverting expectations in ways that are innovative and not just random. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I'll hear back to uh, go Mr. ahead, Raven. Yeah, because uh, <laughs> this is actually a big, yeah, <laughs> this is actually a, a, a big question. And I recommend, it, I mean, obviously, if you're watching the show, you have an interest in theology. But if you found this because you're a Wes Craven fan, uh, David, your your intro to the book is just a, a good uh, encapsulation of of his biography, of his interest, of each and every one of his movies. So, you know, you wrote the bio notes about Craven. Can you tell us more about him, 
his career and his relationship to religion? And, and I know that that's a that's a huge question. You, you did mention yeah. that he was he was born uh, born he was raised evangelical, and you you mentioned some of his struggles with the studio. But if you can uh, end with creativity, but if you could uh, th- tell us more about the man himself. Oh, of course, of course. Uh, born 1939, uh, we have to work through uh, a number of his interviews that he did. Uh, his early childhood was one of tragedy. He hints at a violent home, uh, some sort of threat of patriarchal violence. His father is apparently a very angry person. He leaves before his fifth birthday in some very upsetting circumstances and will have a heart attack and be buried on Wes Craven's fifth birthday. After that, his mother raises him just a strict evangelical Christian, like super strict. No, no, no dancing, no movies, no smoking, just the ultimate clean cut kid possible, which is apparently her mother's response to, if you lack a father figure, I'm really reading into this. Uh, so forgive me if, if Jessica Cravens uh, listens to this, I'm just piecing together a narrative here. Uh, to replace the missing father, well, you have religion. Yeah. Uh, his religious upbringing was so intense that when he was looking at colleges after high school, Wheaton College was on the radar. It's the premier evangelical school in the nation still. They worried it was too liberal. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what are they going to teach you there? you know, is was the fear. Well, Wes, Wes Craven goes to Wheaton, and there he... Another life-shaping event will happen. He becomes a editor of a college literary journal. And as editor, he has two student essays published. One was about an unwed mother, and another was about an interracial couple. Mm-hmm. The president of the college shut down the journal and has a hearing in the chapel before the entire student body, names West by name, saying he's failed his duties as an editor to uphold the moral standards of the college. Unwed mother, somehow they read into this as something damaging to student morality and interracial couples. There's an Elm Street in Wheaton, Illinois. <laughs> Getting up to that. Yeah. Uh, he also experienced a disease that left him unable to attend classes, and he notes that some of the uh, students and professors really showed Christian love to him still. But he was really left with the first great shock of Christianity versus Christians. And what is Christianity has become for some Christians is a means to oppress, suppress, and control what should be what is in the Bible is just love your neighbor as yourself. If your neighbor's an unwed mother, so what? You know, and interracial couple, great, you found love. This is great too. What is shameful about any of this? So it will begin his process of trying to come to an understanding of his life. And that journey, and maybe this is a place where I know one of the questions. A uh, little fun fact behind the scenes. I kind of know some of the questions are coming. So. <laughs> he, Very then, meta. He goes on to John Hopkins University for his master's degree, uh, studies with a, a renowned poet at the time, Elliot Coleman. And unexpectedly, his master's thesis is not research. It is an original novel, which I discovered in my research. Just doing literature review. John Hopkins. Okay, let's go to their library. Maybe so as master's thesis, maybe I can see who he read and maybe that I can read, you know, that into some of his works and Noah's Ark, The Diary of a Madman. <laughs> and so it was during the pandemic and it's like, okay, I keep writing the library, interlibrary loan. No, we're not going to give it to you. <laughs> this, this, I says, I will fly down there get a hotel, mask up, go in, let me add it for two days to read it because I'm writing a book about Wes Craven. He wrote an original novel. So they ended up uh, scanning it. And so I got a PDF of it. And 
Uh, I guess the first thing to mention about it, it reveals the next evolution of this struggles with this faith because Noah's Ark, it's dealing with the patriarchal history of the Hebrew Bible uh, in the book of Genesis. But it's mapped onto his own, or the character within the novels, their own struggles with fitting in a family where there's family secrets that are toxic and drives the narrator progressively unbalanced. And the very end of the novel, he has a spiritual reintegration, emerges out with a new conviction to love their neighbor as oneself. I think is kind of literally one of the few last few lines. I resolve, just like Noah under the under the the Ark of the Rainbow, to love others as myself. So it's really a, a novel about a struggle of coming to terms with a sense of religion and Christianity that makes sense to him after all the authoritarianism and suppression and repression and violence that is recorded in the book of Genesis that apparently the narrator of the novel also experiences it in his own life. And it's truly a fascinating work. And I informed uh, Jessica Craven is like the only one of the uh, his, his children that I've been able to contact. And they know it exists and they're whatever. <laughs> Someday it may be made into, it should be published. should be published. Yeah, but I get a full chapter as that's a review of it. It may never be published. But yeah. yeah. I, uh, I, I think, um, and I'm trying to the, think of the most kind way to say this, but, you know, the, sometimes with the, the theology and pop culture stuff, which I love, it's, it's a little bit, sometimes there's a stretch or there's a huge read-in, right? But, you know, with Wes Craven, this is his first creative work, and, and I don't think you have to go very far to have a theological uh, connection to his book, Noah's Ark. So, you know, don't have a lattice of points of, if this, then, the, you know, trust me, there's a connection here. You just have to stare hard enough. No, it's it's all theological throughout. Yeah. And, and and I really think that does you know the the book has also uh, partly convinced me, but I, I I can see it as well because because I am a fan of his work. That there there really is a strong theological interest in in his works, uh, his many varied works. But before we we get back to that, sure. Jason, I see that you have a question here that that touches on uh, meta narratives, narcissism, but also the problem of evil. We'll link David's previous show where he solved that for us. So yeah. um yeah, so so take it away, Jason. Well, I mean, I, I guess the short version is how does Wes Craven solve that for us? But, um, <laughs> but the, uh, the, yeah, like I think one of the things like between like uh, maybe to say the two most notable works of his of Scream and uh, uh, Nightmare on Elm Street are both dealing with the with a, a malleable narrative form. Like in in Nightmare on Elm Street, you've got the you know, you've got dream dream interpretation happening. And then in Scream, it's like commenting on itself as much as it is commenting on other movies. Um, uh, there's also uh, like, and then the the, the parallel or the read-in, um, you know, is that so much of Gnosticism is defined by both people, both ancient and modern, doing uh, reinterpretations and meta-text narratives, uh, reinterpretations of uh, of religion, and and also trying to solve this problem of evil, like that. Uh, uh, the reason why something bad is happening, you know, it's uh, we're, like either Gnosticism or Wes Craven is is trying to place an answer somewhere, but also that it, it often happens it happens to come from outside of the thing that's happening. Um, just kind of a, like that was that was sort of my my way in, in terms of thinking about this as a Gnostic thing. Um, is there any kind of overall perspective that Wes Craven from like I know I've kind of pointed at two elements but as somebody who's kind of dug through that you've read the earliest stuff you've you've been continuing even his most latest work is there any kind of larger uh like uh larger trend or something that i haven't brought up that you've noticed in this subject maybe <laughs> let me <laughs> let me hazard an answer uh <laughs> there's definitely a sense at least my reading of his works uh, let's start with like the most obvious trope of all. All his monsters are human, or were human, or partially human. Uh, and the struggle is to is to reconcile that somehow. As far as narratives go, what I really detect is 
he sees people as trapped in certain narratives they need to escape. And perhaps mm -hmm. this is most clear is the people under the stairs. There's interesting meta no uh, moment in this film where the titular people under the stairs, they're locked in a dungeon basement of a very pious evangelical uh, mother father is what they're known as, but they're, they're also into S and M and <laughs> beating kids, locking up bad kids in the basement, but the bad kids in the basement, when you get to see them, their only entertainment is watching TV, and what they're watching is the the shock and awe of the Iraq bombardment of the what the U.S. is doing to throw overthrow Saddam Hussein during the Gulf War. Mm -hmm. So it was a really interesting thing of people just huddled in front of their TV as their only reality, and the the hope of the characters and they'll find their deliverance is to escape that narrative. And it's not only the narrative of being trapped in that way, the larger shell over that is of poverty. Uh, it's a white couple, they're victimizing uh, inner city uh, uh, people of color. And it very much becomes a liberation theology and very much about capitalism as well. Uh, the couple are exploity, exploitive landlords who have incredible high rents and drive everyone into poverty and they keep all the gold hidden in their house. At the end, they get rid of the couple, they destroy the dungeon, the kids under the stairs are set free and gold is raining down from the sky. <laughs> it's a message about breaking the narratives that control your lives. And so what is keeping you trapped in your own personal dungeon, uh, you know, with whatever is keeping you bound to whatever reality that you hate. Is it fear? Is it insecurity? Is it shame? Um, what is it? I think he's very much a director that wants us to look at the narratives that are controlling our lives and critically reevaluate them, sometimes through the eyes of the characters in his movies. So maybe that's an answer to your question. No, I yeah, I think it, it entirely is. I th and that's okay. great. Um, uh, I think that, uh, like... The um, I'm going to freestyle a little a little bit here, Jonathan. Um, Drop a beat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, not quite. <laughs> um, <laughs> more like I'm going off the script. But uh, the what was I going to say? The um, so uh, like I participate in a lot of the Gnosticism stuff online, uh, but generally like that's like there's Discord and Reddit are kind of the the two places I probably talk about it most and. Most of like a lot of what I'm seeing in the discourse is that people will show up, particularly like I think Reddit is a place where everybody goes to ask their first question about something. And yes. so most Reddit uh, like threads are going to be a bunch of people asking the same question over and over again because it's their first time. Um, and so what I what I sort of routinely see is a focus and uh, focus on people approaching Gnosticism and looking for the the answer to the problem of evil. And looking for an easy answer, essentially, mm -hmm. um, that like, okay, great, Demiurge, it's the Demiurge's fault, it's the Archon's fault, everything's like, I just need to like transcend this physical universe and then I'm good. Um, and also like in the meantime, uh, none of the bad stuff is my fault because it's, you know, I live in this material universe that the bad guy created. Yeah. Um, and then all of the questions, all of the focus tends to be about like, how powerful is the Demiurge? How do I beat the Demiurge? Like, how do I... Um, like, uh, how, or, or like, aren't we so much better than people who don't know that there's a demiurge? Um, I'm going to interrupt. Sorry, Jason. I actually got temporarily kicked off the discord because people were asking questions like that. And, uh, and, the, and I started writing up uh, who would win in a fight, Thor or Superman. <laughs> um, so <laughs> sorry. No, well, and, and here's the thing is that like, uh, I, and to anybody and to any of those people who might be watching this. I get the question. Like, I do understand the reason for the question. Yeah, we don't want to mock um, people who are who are finding something new and, and being uh, very uh, grabbed by this uh, interesting and powerful mythology, right? Like, mm -hmm. we're not, we're not, we are. I, I, I guess we're having a little fun, but we're we're not mocking you. Like, we want you to be interested in this stuff. Dive in. Yeah. So, well, and and I think I, I and I think that sometimes that that teasing or that like that uh, impatience with these kinds of questions. Um, it comes because I think what you and I'm this is me trying to bring it back is the is that um, a lot of what what I think the value of a, of a Gnostic perspective is 
is it's asking you to, to, to widen your gaze at the problem that you're looking at and not look at it as, um, um, as just like the same rules, one level up. Um, so it's not that the world sucks because someone made it suck. It's like the world sucks because we are making, like we make mistakes. Mistakes are things that happen. And how do you engage with those mistakes? And how do you question the narrative that is leading you to those mistakes? Yeah. Um, and, uh, uh, and it's like the, the, that tension of like wanting to try to, how do we provoke someone to, 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 to cast their gaze wider, you know, um, to, to think more broadly, um, about the, about the subject is I think what a metatextual, um, a narrative inherently does is it inherently makes you realize you're seeing a text, makes you realize that you're, and then makes you interact with that text, which is, I think maybe why Wes Craven stuff, especially why all like why scream and and um uh, uh nightmare on elm street were so provocative is that that going back to that sense of novelty the novelty they offered was the chance to question exactly what you were doing you know yeah uh, and what was happening oh indeed uh, it's i mean i'm not gonna resist the urge to edit uh myself as i speak a question that could be asked is how am I contributing to the evil I'm experiencing in my own life rather than what is actually causing the evil in my life or the evil that I witness. It is a dance mm -hmm. and you need a partner to dance with, uh, to create, uh, whatever it is that's keeping you stuck or keeping you frustrated or keeping you victimized. Mm -hmm. And that definitely comes through and it may be an opportunity to, to talk about this that one of the you know i'm the editor of this book and in many senses is stolen honor because the contributors of this book really shine mm -hmm. and emmy bay uh, emmy amy beddows has a chapter on on the nightmare on elm street particularly looking at nancy and heather but in the dynamics of an abusive relationship Mm -hmm. that Freddy really comes across as a stalker who is trying to convince the victim of his stalking that they're in a relationship and to make her participate in this relationship with lines like, I'm your boyfriend now, and the phone wagging its tongue at her, uh, mm -hmm. to violating her personal spaces like her bedroom, coming out over her as she sleeps, or when she's in a bathtub, the hand coming up from between her legs with ablated knives. It is all about violation of personal space. And what, what Amy is reveals is typically the final girl narrative is helpless little girl learns to fight back, assume male power, and that is the answer to female empowerment. But this is not what Wes Draven does. The original nightmare... Uh, the character Nancy defeats Freddy by kind of literally saying, I'm taking back my power. You're not real. And literally just turns her back on him and he can't hurt her. Mm -hmm. So it's very much of escaping. You got an evil chasing you. And the answer is not to totally focus on Freddy, but how are you giving him power? How are yeah. you participating in this? So, if you state it like that, that's really uncomfortable. I'd rather blame a demiurge for the problems of my life, that this is a monster with bladed hands, but the monster needs to dance. And so when she refuses to dance with him, he jumps at her, kind of disappears in special effects. And that was the original ending of the film. I think there is a message in there of, you know, you get... Yeah, I feel like I'm kind of mansplaining a, a superior artist's work, but she's not here. Uh, you get out of abuse relationship by not participating in it anymore. No more explanations, no more excuses, no more going over it one more time. Just, you know, don't give them anything to work with to break you down emotionally or physically. You know, it's part of what she reveals in her analysis of, you know, how these powerful women are true final girls are so not just assuming male power to you know what i'll bring out a chainsaw that's how you vanquish the monster yeah, I mean, sometimes just to walk away 
Yeah, I really like that. And like what? Because uh, often, often when uh, um, when this kind of thing is debated, I think uh, some Gnostics they they kind of bridle at the idea that it's all in your head. You know, like that it's uh, that we're just talking about psychological things. And I, I I hear that, and I also agree with that. Like I don't think it's just all in your head is necessarily the right answer either. Um, but, um, but making it more about how am I giving the, the demiurge or anything power is a really interesting way to, to, I think, still appropriately frame it. That isn't just, it's in your head, but is, Mm -hmm. but is also not like who would win in a fight, which archon would beat which angel, you know? Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, Great. Obviously. Well, and thank you for the nuance because obviously Freddie kills people who, you know, he's definitely a physical evil that can enter into the real world and slays Johnny Depp and a few other characters in gruesome ways, and they never gave him power. He just has this power. But her particular narrative to escape it was to reclaim her power. Mm-hmm. And because he was really the focus of the attention of wanting a relationship with her uh, in a particular way and just disposing of anyone around her that was competing for her attention it really becomes a predatory film you know when you look at it uh yeah he's getting rid of her boyfriends and all her friends so freddie's gonna be the only thing in her life that is emotional hostage taking that is scary stuff yeah and you know it's the kind of thing too where where people are like oh uh, you're always doing feminist readings of a simple horror movie right but it's it's very the, uh, on the surface uh just as you stated yeah, he, he, a bitch yeah <laughs> like that word so I, yeah that's not a feminist reading about it that's that's overt text not subtext and I, uh, uh i actually want to quote you here david uh just to, to tie a bow on this particular section yeah. there is um because there's a section when you talk about new nightmare at the end where you uh where um like it's discussing uh whether or not like kruger can only be captured in storytelling that, that phrase really caught me and uh the from your book um the message apparently is that fiction and cinema serve as a catharsis for the secret sins that plague the human soul, allowing us to exercise that evil from society safely. The film is thus a commentary on the horror genre itself that is both fun and healthy, or that it is both fun and healthy. And I think that's, again, that's interesting of like this storytelling, meta meta storytelling as ways to engage with, encounter, and move past some of these, some of these sensations and feelings. Um, So, yeah. Jonathan, back to you. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, we should move on to some of the other films. But on the other hand, people who have randomly found this due to the YouTube algorithm, uh, they, they want Freddy. <laughs> so I was just wondering, because it is a, a strong uh, uh, theological point in building on uh, a previous feminist theology. So it, the name of Amy Beto's uh, essay is The Freddy versus the Myth of Feminine Evil, Nancy and Heather as Redemptresses in, re, sorry, Redemptresses, in a nightmare on Elm Street. Um, can you tell us about the theologian Mary Daly's idea of feminine evil, you know, and how this plays into the movie? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and a wonderful reading. I encountered her in my grad school days. And uh, the wonderful de- definitely a, an eye opener, a must read. But. Please. Traditional femininity, as explained by Mary Daly, and the qualities of what that should be from a male perspective involve passivity and timidity and basically, you know, helpfulness and those type of things. And women who act outside of that are seen as as transgressive in of uh, transgressing like in a way that offends God of like okay the church theologian Tertulli uh he was kicked out but he's still an influential church uh theologian you know makes an interesting comment that Adam and Eve and the serpent that at least Eve did back <laughs> she entered into dialogue <laughs> with the serpent they asked back and forth. There was actually an exchange there. She acquitted herself well. Tertullian says 
she behaved like the masculine person and Adam just did what he's told. He was feminine in that relationship. So it's about traditional gender roles as defined by patriarchy. And this is the dynamic that's partially explored in the, the nightmare universe of women aren't believed. They are told they're imagining it. They need just sleeping pills and medicine. They, the patriarchs will not listen to her. And so Nancy trying to find her power is frustrated at every point by her father, her friends around her. No one believes women until the bodies start dropping. You know, I think she has this line, if only they listened to the girl who knew everything, that they have to go out of their way to prove it. I pulled this hat out of the dream, mom. <laughs> you know, it still doesn't convince them. It's like, what do you have to do to be believed? And so this is like tying into the Me Too movement. What, when are women actually trusted for their opinions and their experiences, uh, especially what's happening to them? And so this is the emotional tension that drives this. And so uh, Amy Beddoes uses Mary Daly to help explore some of the theological subtext, the emotional dynamics we see on the screen of... Nancy trying to find her voice, power, and confidence in a universe that shuts her down on every side. That no one believes, like, even at the end, <laughs> she finds her father, like, in the neighbor's house, filled with dead bodies. Come on. It's like, to keep her quiet, we'll send someone over there, you know, to, to check out. They discover there's actually something serious. She was right all along. A uh, very frustrating experience. So, yeah. Uh, uh, available for free at any library. Just make your library order it and definitely read it for uh, Amy Beddoes' essay. Uh, it's truly wonderful. I'm not doing it justice for her. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, I've got 13 desolate questions here for you. Uh, uh, so, <laughs> yeah, we've done shows on voodoo before, and, uh, and a big part of those shows was kind of clearing up the many stereotypes and misconceptions about the religion. So that, and, and sorry for all the nestled questions. What is the serpent in the rainbow? How does it portray Haiti and voodoo? <laughs> is it really based on a true story? And Christopher Garland's 13 fragments about zombies, voodoo, and Wes Craven's The Serpent in the Rainbow, it's, it's almost an experimental piece. It's, it's a, quite a delight to find in an academic book. So what was your reaction to it and, and working with it? I take all credit. <laughs> uh, no, it's truly an amazing piece. I'll start with that. Because it's the perfect place to start. Christopher Garland created the title, title of the essay, something like 13 Fragments on Serpent in the Rainbow and Voodoo, something like that. And it's fragments that definitely reads like random pieces of, of, of a larger narrative that's been recovered. And it's left to you to assemble it. Uh, these 13 little stories or anecdotes or half-developed thoughts, it's because the complete narrative is never successfully been written so he knows i'm not the guy to write this no one's available to write this haiti's writing its own story is a story not yet finished what i can't offer you are 13 reflections to inform your own struggle with this so that is the story to how he approaches the subject the subject is the serpent and the rainbow so, yeah, that is your holiday, uh, Halloween watching. It is truly a directorial masterpiece of that will get your heart pumping. It is a brilliant work by Craven, uh, just as it appears on the screen. But when you start looking at the dynamics, it becomes even more fascinating. So the movie is set during the time of Baby Dr. Valier in Haiti, uh, a tyrant who uses the Tom Tom Makut to control the population, and one of their weapons of control is voodoo. And the story is based on, okay, so based on a true story, it's based on what's purported to be a true story, an ethnobiography by a certain uh, person whose own narrative has been called into question, but it was given to a craven to make it into a movie, and he wisely has the main character experiencing all of his experiences in Haiti 
it begins like in the Amazon where he ingests a psychotropic drug. Therefore, everything you witness in the movie through his eyes could be the lingering effects of a psychotropic drug and not actually voodoo. That is brilliant because he's not saying voodoo is a scary magic coming from dark-skinned people in Haiti. It's exotic, therefore scary and monstrous. It is at least buffered with, this is his perceptions. I'm not saying this is what voodoo is. And Wes Craven goes out of his way to have uh, the academic words an informant. People in the movie who tell the true story of voodoo is this. It's a beautiful religion. Our God is not in heaven. God is in our bodies. And this is how we experience spirituality. And it has beautiful scenes of people in a waterfall worshiping uh, the Virgin Mary, a syncretism with voodoo belief. So it is not a film to point at the exotic and say it's scary. It's actually inviting you to break down some of this. The real violence in the film is the Tom Tom Akut and maybe Dr. Valier. And, but voodooism, or vadu, uh, Christopher Garland uh, pronounced it uh, in a different way, something like vadu uh, is how it's pronounced. The first fragment of the 13 fragments, he recounts a story of his own graduate advisor on a trip to Gainesville, uh, you know, on a road trip, saying, yeah, I, yeah, I'm working with this guy in Haiti. He has a store, small farm, and a zombie. What? <laughs> so what you'll recover from the 13 fragment, what is voodoo, is in part fragmentary narrative here the people of Haiti have been under the control originally by France then later by United States by other powers never been self-determining uh, as a political reality even though it's the first uh, successful slave rebellion uh, in history it's been kept subjugated yeah. and so part of what the zombie is is a recreation of of subjugation that people are psychologically tricked into or surrender into because someone's gotten power over them. So it is very much a echo of intergenerational trauma manifested in victimhood and power relationships within 80 that serve to perpetuate more victimhood. Uh, so there is some really deep, subtle work here that even Christopher Garland is saying here's 13 pieces of different thoughts that are happening around this and all the complexity from uh, the perceived exoticism of Haiti to uh, uh, to the AIDS epidemic and the fears surrounding that to colonialism and you know, it is still a nation developing its own narrative, therefore outsiders shouldn't give it. And therefore he writes a fragmentary piece. So yeah, I'm glad you identified its actual presentation of volume is brilliant. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, during lockdown, my wife, she can't really watch scary movies, but you know, I, I like to watch uh, uh, the themed movies around this time of the year. In particular, during lockdown, we had more time than usual. So, you know, I was figuring out stuff that we could watch together that, that she could handle, right? So that meant horror comedy. <laughs> so as as I wrote here, The Vampire in Brooklyn Defender is logged on. We actually watched it together, and I warned her, you know, I said, you know, this movie doesn't have a very good reputation, and it was a flop. But, you know, I, I know it's not very scary. I saw it on cable a thousand years ago. I don't remember it very well. And, and we both enjoyed it a lot. We, we both thought it was it was a great, fun little movie. Like, there are some obvious problems. There's some pacing problems. It should be about a half an hour shorter. It's uh, it's what I call a TPS film, how I originally saw it. You're flipping through the channels. Uh, this comes on. You should actually stay and watch it. Um, and, and Wikipedia does tell me that, that it has been redeemed that, as a cult film. It has become more recognized since, since it originally premiered in the 90s, where, again, it was a flop. It got a lot of bad critical coverage. It got a lot of mockery. It was kind of meant as Eddie Murphy's comeback, but it, it was uh, that's sort of a failure in that regard. Um, but in Laughing with Wes Craven, Monstrosity and Otherness in Craven's Comedy Horror Films by Catherine Jeanette McCrary, 
she she writes about this uh uh that whole preamble by the way has nothing to do with the question uh <laughs> continue she writes, what does monstrosity teach us about otherness? And in the case of Vampire in Brooklyn, racial otherness. Yes. That was the question? Yeah, yeah. That, that's the actual question. Yeah. I'll <laughs> tie it into, I, I did hear a question mark at the end, but yeah. <laughs> uh, she did a brilliant reading of that film together in dialogue with Cursed, another fan favorite because it didn't receive critical claim at its time. And, oh my God, if I can only get my brain started, um, a theme of tonight. What is the monster? The monster is the unfamiliar, the uncomfortable, and sometimes what stirs a sense of revulsion or abhorrence of some kind. And the sub-theme of both of these films is... The monstrous is otherness. It cursed it is queerness in in Vampire in Brooklyn. It is the otherness of a particular stereotype, the figure of uh, the Igor to Eddie Murphy's uh, vampire. He comes across as a very stereotypical New Yorker, uh, you know, not a very serious person. And through the course of the film, he keeps getting more and more grotesque. And he loses eyes, he loses pettages, he becomes more ghoulish, until at the very end, he gets the vampire's ring, he becomes handsome again, he loses his Brooklyn accent, he becomes sophisticated with a little Caribbean lilt to his voice. He has moved from the grotesque caricature of an inner city person in Brooklyn that is a laughing stock to someone empowered at the end. While in Cursed, it's the subtext is the otherness is queerness that makes people uncomfortable. And that is subverted uh, at the end with uh, lycanthropy being like, uh, you know, getting gay from being around someone who's gay. Uh, being a subtext. So she really adds a level of consideration that the genius of these films is not necessarily Eddie Murphy's performance, but in what's happening to the side characters, Bo, I think he cursed, and whatever that character's name who's the sidekick to Eddie Murphy in Vampire in Brooklyn. But it is an interesting film. <laughs> uh, Jason, before my, my very important and relevant final question, do you have uh, uh, threads you want to pull on? Uh, anything to clarify? Anything running through your head? Um, I'm just, uh, let me, let me, um, you know, I think I'm going to let you go with your question because I think I'm still tying thoughts back together as well. So I might, I might come back with something after your question. Right, right. And by the way, I didn't mention Curse because I saw it in the theaters on a date and it didn't work out. So uh, the hashtag <laughs> triggers by that movie. Um, <laughs> so, uh, David, can you do a sequel book of essays that's just about Deadly Friend? I am. Uh, all, I saw that question. I'm just so happy that film has a fan base. <laughs> uh, part of the story, an entire book, well, how many chapters of it are, will you write? Okay. Yeah. Is question number one. But <laughs> there is a thing about Wes Craven. One of his best friends was Sam Raimi. And they often have little homages to each other's works in their films. I believe Sam Emery started with, uh, he had a character tear out a poster on the wall that was the Hills Have Eyes, saying, hey, buddy, here's the real boy. And I think in Nightmare on Elm Street, Nancy's trying to stay awake by watching a Sam Raimi film, Evil Dead, and puts her to sleep. Touche. <laughs> so what I like about Deadly Friend is the, the scene, the scene where an elderly woman has her head exploded by a basketball thrown by a robotic corpse. <laughs> and she walks around the room cartoonishly without a head. That is a pure O to Sam Raimi and yeah. people dead. And so that's the best part of the film. But it's also a case of, apparently, it was supposed to be a short circuit, that film with Ali Sheedy and a cute robot, made a lot of money, let's do something like that. And then it was rewritten to become a horror film. 
So it started off as a comedy and then they try to make a horror. So it's a horror comedy. Like, does this work? <laughs> I guess it works for some people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it is funny because, yeah, I guess the studio wanted uh, uh, wanted a horror movie. The the, uh, the the original sort of audience testing, they were expecting a Wes Craven horror movie. But, you know, this was the 80s, you know, that, that kind of like yeah. dark sci-fi fantasy that, as you just mentioned, was doing well at the box office. So I don't know what, what, the, what, what those executives in Hollywood were thinking. But that said, I love it the way that it is. So, um, and, uh, you know, you actually mentioned... You, you can only do so much in a book, right? You can't have uh, essays in every film. There's going to be some favorites left out. I was I was sad that there was nothing on Shocker. But, I, do, uh, I do have it in my introduction. I do have, like, yeah. chapter one, I give at least some treatment to everything he did, from his comic books to his yep. TV shows to Shocker, which is also a Sam Raimi-inspired. The, the end of Shocker is the best Sam Raimi film Sam Raimi never made. <laughs> I'll mention that. It's well, funny. and and uh, like so, uh, when I read through that that uh, that overview, that sort of Craven overview, um, uh, it's uh, like I think one of the things that I, this is uh, I think what's often so interesting about horror because most and or arguably the best horror or the horror that that remains notable over time is horror that where the uh, where the creators are making something in response to something. Yes. Um, and uh, uh, even if it, even if all it is is its response to short circuit made money, let's see if we can make something else. And like, the Craven is uh, even even if it is a like um, um uh, like a general misfire, perhaps you know, creatively because it's it's coming from a, you know, like trying to follow a trend. Is that even Craven doing that can still make something interesting? You know, can still make something that that that's uh, surprised the heck out of you. You know. Oh yeah. Um, uh, and, and like also just in that chapter, like I, I want to kind of look at the, uh, one of your closing remarks here was that, um, and this also brings it back to the, to the meta thing. I swear I wasn't trying to bring this all around in some sort of cyclical way. It's just, you know, take credit, maybe man, take credit. <laughs> Great. Okay. Yes. All intentional. Um, I, I'm rewriting the Bible here. Um, so no, so the, uh, the meta textual thing here is that I'm, that I'm thinking about is that your, one of your last notes in that first chapter is. Uh, this is because his tale brings to the fore our relationships to the same God that once demanded the punishment of innocent children. And, and again, like, this is something like I mentioned, uh, earlier, like, uh, people on, uh, on Gnostic, uh, internet forums and such are always like, they're, they're, they're always asking these questions like, um, and what brings them to Gnosticism is, is a pursuit of the question, like, how can this and this exist in the same spiritual yes. you know, system? Um, and uh, and that l quite literally, Craven is doing that same thing. He's asking that question, and you know he's he's asking it through the lens of horror, and perhaps outside of a theological dialogue, but it's it's still kind of like asking, uh, what do you do with a world in which that exists? You know, yes. Um, and uh, yeah, and I think like just that's that's something I I used to have a uh, be interested in Gnosticism specifically because I was interested in Gnosis, but more and more I also see that its value is is that it's it's all it's trying to ask critical questions about what's going on, you know, and why why we have some of these difficulties that we have. And if you don't if you don't have that part, if it's just pursuing Gnosis, then it's kind of more just Buddhism, <laughs> you know. Yeah, um, Buddhism has got like. You know, let go of your attachments, Nirvana. There you go. I'm really reducing Buddhism here. That is oh wait, uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt again, but you know, I'm surprised you didn't have any essays from a Buddhist perspective, David, because the the Buddha was always saying, "What we need is Wes Craven. We need we need Wes Craven." Okay, I, continue, David. I, oh, sorry, continue, David. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's it. I'm gonna yeah. get okay. I put out a call. For, I really wanted some Buddhist perspectives. I keep joking. Okay. I'm going to do a next book on the Saw series with just Buddhist perspectives, you know, teaching detachment. Literally. <laughs> <laughs> but the Odyssey. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, there is a lot of struggle with, I mean, the tension, one tension, particular scene in the first nightmare. Uh, he's chasing Tina, the whole big long arm scene. And I think she prays, God help me, or oh God, 
And Freddie goes, this is God, and points to his face, which I read as the same God you're praying to both did this to me, made me a burn victim, and is going to allow you to die at my bladed hand. So this idea of the problem of evil and retri retributive justice that Wes Craven does struggle with this. It was Freddy Krueger is a bastard child. A bastard is doomed to hell, according to the Hebrew Bible. Uh, this will change later, but... I mean, in the Middle Ages, if your parents weren't married, you had to, like, fake your birth certificates in order to get anywhere. It was, to be a bastard is to be condemned of God. And yet, he is visiting the sins of the parents on their children, which is also Hebrew Bible. So, it's the instruments of God's justice. Uh, they killed somebody. They, you know, thou shall not kill. Now, he's killed. Who's the real evil person? So definitely theodicy is a meditation throughout his entire career of works. I think at this point I'll introduce the film he fought for once he had absolute power to ask for what he wanted. He just made Scream, which made tons of money, and the film company says, we'll give you anything you want, just make sequels. <laughs> he says, I want to make music of the heart. This is a Meryl Streep film, and he chose it on purpose. And it's going to be the answer to the problem of theodicy. And The Last House on the Left is about what violence did to destroy a generation of turning just innocent teenagers into killers. And it came out of reflections. Uh, Wes Graver briefly was a college professor during Vietnam. And he knew if he gave any student at his class less than a B, they would have to go to Vietnam. Imagine being being that. And so he was witnessing the entire gener and he ended up quitting that job. I couldn't he couldn't handle that. The students weren't there to learn. They were there to escape being killed or being killers. Yeah, let's read uh chapter this or that. So the last house of the left is what damaged entire generation. The most haunting thing about that is its all American soundtrack. Some of the songs aren't just beautiful, happy teenagers just living their lives, but they will become absolutely bloodthirsty, irredeemable killers. And, you know, that is juxtaposed, or to use a musical plot, a counterpoint is music of the heart, a true story of how uh, a single mother asked to be sent to the most troubled inner city school in New York City. They sent her to Harlem. She says, I'm going to teach Mozart to kids because that's what they need. And she, with a little bit of love, with a little bit of carry, she took kids that were destined for gang life. They, they pull off knives off kids. There are school shootings. And with a little bit of love, you can redeem a generation. So part of his message about the Odyssey is what we can do about the world is fight for the world we want. One act of kindness and love at a time. You know, love your neighbors yourself is for that inner city uh, uh, Italian American mother was these kids need someone to care about them and see them as something other than juvenile delinquents and future gang members. They're just kids, and she taught a Mozart. Her school still exists today. Uh, mm. Opus something Harlem's School of Music, and so I think Wes Craven deliberately chose that as. The counterpoint to the hill, um, not the hills have eyes, but the last house on the left. We can destroy a generation uh, through wars and violence and intergenerational trauma. There's a father and son dynamic in that film where the father drives the son to commit suicide. As counterpointed by the music of the heart where you can save kids that are even suffered unbelievable neglect, damage, and racism and so if his monsters are human the heroes are too and i think that's one of the craven's messages of we have the power to change the lives around us if if we recognize our own lives and maybe the lives of others too yeah well then that's a great uh, that's a great ending point
Uh, David, you, you already gave uh, our listeners and watchers some great advice, which is this is an expensive academic tome, but you can go to the uh, link that we're going to put in uh, the show notes. It's also on the screen for those watching. And you can send that to your local library and they can purchase a copy. Uh, yes. Most libraries actually have a, a place on their website where you can request books. So please do that or go out and buy it. Like, you know, what are the others? Or see if your library already has it. Take it out and read it because it, it's an awesome book. And um, also for uh, supporting, you can uh, help us keep doing the show by going to patreon.com slash Gnostic. Unlike other podcasts, we don't really give you anything for giving us money. We do give you early access to the shows, but I remember. A, a good thing about that, though, is if you give us a buck and then cancel, if you ever give us any money at all, you still get that access. Uh, we don't take you off the Patreon list, so you still get that, that early access. And uh, soon, our, actually, uh, we've recorded a lot of shows at our bank, so the you're going to be getting a treasure chest of uh of like many 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 shows so uh send them some money and i'll show the cat ah, there's, <laughs> there's the cat yay now pay some money <laughs> uh, <laughs> do one time donations at paypal.me <laughs> okay everybody happy halloween or uh he's not just a horror director so happy whatever day it is that you're listening you're watching to this uh david it's been a real delight Thank bye you. everybody bye everybody